dedicated to my son Sean Anthony Steele, in loving memory of my father Richard Steele. Thus much concerning the planetary deities, who were called by the ancients, the governors of the world. In the next place therefore, let us direct our attention to what Plato and his best interpreter Proclus have transmitted to us concerning Minerva, who as a mundane divinity is connected with Ether, and has also an allotment in the celestial regions. Plato then in the Timors describes this goddess as both a lover of war, and a lover of wisdom, for he says that she is full of polemic and philosophic, as she everywhere however exerts this twofold power, according to her intellectual, supermundane, and mundane subsistence, I shall present the reader with the whole of what Proclus says, 25, respecting these two powers of the goddess, in his commentary on that part of the Timors where she is celebrated by Plato, in the Demiurgus and Father, says he, of the whole world, many orders of gods that have the form of the one present themselves to the view and those are of a garden, or demiurgic, or elevating, or connective, or perfective characteristic, but the undefiled and untamed deity Minerva, is one of the first intellectual unities subsisting in the demiurgus, according to which he himself remains firm and immutable, and all things proceeding from him participate of inflexible power, and through which he intellectually perceives everything, and is separate in an exempt manner from all beings. All theologists therefore, call this divinity Minerva, as being brought forth indeed from the summit of her father, and abiding in him, being a demiurgic, separate, and immaterial intelligence. Hence Socrates in the Cratylus, celebrates her as Theono. Theonoi. Ordific intellection, but as, in conjunction with other divinities sustaining all things in the one Demiurgus, and arranging wholes, together with her father, through the first of these, they denominate her philosophic, but through the second philopolemic, for she who according to the form of one connectedly contains all the paternal wisdom is a philosopher, and she who invariably rules over all contrariety, may be properly called a lover of war. Hence Orpheus speaking of her birth says, that Jupiter generated her from his head, with armor shining like a brazen flower, since however, it was necessary that she should proceed into second and third orders, she appears in the order to which Proserpine belongs, according to the undefiled Hectored, but she generates every virtue from herself, and elevating powers and illuminates secondary natures with intellect, and an undefiled life, hence she is called Quatrita Genes, she likewise appears among the liberated gods, uniting the lunar order with intellectual and demiurgic light, causing the productions of those divinities to be undefiled, and demonstrating the one unity of them to be unmingled with their depending powers, she also appears in the heavens and the sublunary region, and according to the united gift of herself, imparts the cause both of the philosophic and the philopolemic power, for her inflexibility is intellectual, and her separate wisdom is pure and unmingled with secondary natures, and the one characteristic peculiarity of Minerva providence, extends as far as to the last orders, for since wherever there are partial souls that resemble her divinity, they exert an admirable prudence, and exhibit an unconquerable strength, what ought we to say of her attendant choirs of damons or divine, mundane, liberated, and ruling orders, for all these receive us from a fountain the twofold peculiarity of this goddess, hence also the divine poet, Homer, indicating both these powers of Minerva, in conjunction with fabulous devices says, the radiant veil her sacred fingers wove, floats in rich waves, and spreads the court of Jove, her father's warlike robe her limbs invests, 26, in which verses by the veil which she wove, and to which she gave subsistence by her intellections, her intellectual wisdom is signified, 
that by the warlike robe of Jupiter we must understand her demiurgic providence, which immutably takes care of mundane natures, and prepares more divine beings always to have dominion in the world. Hence also, I think Homer represents her as an associate in battle with the Greeks against the barbarians, just as Plato here relates that she was an associate with the Greeks against the inhabitants of the Atlantic island, in order that everywhere more intellectual and divine natures may rule over such as are more irrational and vile, for Mars also is a friend to war and contrarieties, but with a separation and division more adapted to the things themselves, Minerva however, connects contrariety, and illuminates the subjects of her government with union, hence likewise she is said to be full of polemic, for, strife, fighting, war, she always loves, and she is a friend to war indeed, because she is allotted the summit of separation, but she is a lover of contrarieties, because these are in a certain respect congregated through this goddess, in consequence of better natures having dominion, on this account likewise, the ancients co-arranged victory with Minerva, if therefore, these things are rightly asserted, she is philosophic indeed, as being demiurgic intelligence, and a separate and immaterial wisdom, hence also, she is called Metis by the gods, but she is full of polemic, as connecting the contrarieties in holes, and as an untamed and inflexible deity, on this account likewise, she preserves Beccus undefiled, but vanquishes the giants in conjunction with her father. She too alone shakes the Aegis, without waiting for the mandate of Jupiter. She also hurls the javelin, shook by her arm. The massy javelin bends, huge, ponderous, strong that when her fury burns. Whole ranks of heroes tames and overturns, 27, again, she is phosphorus as every way extending intellectual light, the Saviour, as establishing every partial intellect in the total intellections of her father, again, or the artificer, as presiding over demiurgic works, hence the theologist Orpheus says, that the father produced her, that she the queen might be of mighty works, but she is Caligus, or the beautiful fabricator, as connecting by beauty all the works of the Father, a virgin, as exerting an undefiled and unmingled purity, an aegis, or aegis bearing, as moving the whole of fate, and being the leader of its productions, with respect to the spear and shield with which this goddess, in the statues of her, is represented as armed, jamblichus, as we are informed by Proclus, 28 explains these in a most divinely inspired manner as follows, since every divine nature ought to act and not to suffer, in order that by operating it may not have the inefficacious which is similar to matter, but by not suffering, it may not have that efficacy which resembles material natures, that produce. Accompanied with passion, that it may have neither of these, he asserts that shields are powers, through which a divine nature remains impassive and pure, surrounding itself with an infrangible guard, but spears are powers, according to which it proceeds without contact through all things, operates in all things, amputating a material nature, and giving assistance to every generation producing form. These powers, however, are first seen about Minerva, hence also in the statues of her she is armed with a spear and shield for she vanquishes everything, and according to theologists, remains inflexibly, and uncontaminated in her father, but these things are seen in a secondary degree in the Minerval powers, both in such as a whole, and such as a partial, for as the Jovian and Demiurgic multitudes imitate their monads, and as the prophetic and Apolloniacal multitudes participate of the characteristic peculiarity of Apollo. Thus also the Minerval number adumbrates the uncontaminated and unmingled nature of Minerva, and they are seen ultimately in Minerval souls, for in these also the shield is the untamed and inflexible power of reason, but the spear is that which is incisive of matter, 
and which liberate souls. From the perturbations arising from Damon's or Destina, with respect to the mundane allotment also of this goddess who proceeds supernally from intellectual causes to the earth, Proclus observes, in Tim page 43, that she primarily subsists in her father, but secondarily in the supermundane gods, that her third progression is in the twelve liberated rulers, and that after this, she unfolds into light a liberated authority in the heavens, in one way ended in the inner attic sphere, for there also, a certain allotment of this goddess is expanded, whether it be the place about the ram, or that about the virgin, or whether it be someone of the northern stars, as the electra which is there is by certain persons asserted to be, but she unfolds this power in another way in the sun, for there also an admirable power, and a Minerva order, fabricates holes, according to theologists, in conjunction with the sun, and again, in another way in the moon, being the monad of the triad, 29, which is there, but in another way in the earth, according to the similitude of the allotments of the earth to the celestial distributions, and lastly, she unfolds this liberated authority differently in different parts of the earth. According to the peculiarities of providential energy, this being the case, it is by no means wonderful that one deity, Minerva, is said by Plato to have been allotted Athens, and says in Egypt, for it must not be supposed, that because partial souls are not naturally adapted to inhabit two bodies at once, this is also impossible to the gods but there is a participation of the same divine power according to different places, yet in the one power there is also multitude, and by this place, indeed, it is participated in one way, but by other places in a different way, and in some sameness is more abundant, but in others difference, in another part, likewise, of the same admirable work, page 30, Proclus observes of this goddess, that it is manifest from the Greeks, that her dominion extends from on high as far as to the last of things, for they say she was generated from the summit or head of Jupiter, but the Egyptians relate that this inscription was written in the additum of the goddess, I am the things that are, that will be, and that have been, no one has ever laid open the garment by which I am concealed, the fruit which I brought forth was the sun, thirty, the goddess, therefore, being demiurgic, and at the same time apparent. And unapparent, has an allotment in the heavens, and illuminates generation with forms, for of the signs of the zodiac, the ram is ascribed to the goddess, and the equinoctial circle itself, where especially a power motive of the universe is established and thus much concerning the philopolemic and philosophic goddess Minerva. Chapters Xi. Let us in the next place direct our attention to that great mundane divinity the earth, and consider what it is, whence it proceeds, and how it is said by Plato in the Timors to be our nurse, and the most ancient and first of the gods within the heavens, deriving our information about this goddess also from Proclus in Tim page 280, earth and proceeds primarily from the intelligible earth which comprehends all the intelligible orders of the gods, and is eternally established in the Father, 31, it also proceeds from the intellectual earth which is co-arranged with heaven, and all the productions of which it receives, for being analogous to these, it also abides perpetually as in the center of the heavens, and being contained, on all sides by them, is full of generative power, and demiurgic perfection, the true earth, therefore, is neither this corporeal formed and gross belk, for it will not be the most ancient of the gods from its belk, nor the first of the gods that are arranged within the heavens, nor is it the soul of this body, for it would not be, as Plato says it is extended about the pole of the universe, since not the soul, but the body of the earth is a thing of this kind, but if it be necessary to speak what is most true concerning it, 
It is an animal consisting of a divine soul, and a living body, hence the whole is, as Plato says, an animal, for there are in it an immaterial and separate intellect, a divine soul dancing round this intellect, an ethereal body proximately suspended from its informing soul, and in the last place, this visible bulk, which is on all sides inspired with life by the vehicle of this soul, with which also being filled, it generates and nourishes all various animals, for some animals, 32, are rooted in it, but others about it, and this likewise, Aristotle perceiving, was a shame not to give to the earth a natural life, for whence is it that plants while they remain in the earth live, but when devils from it die, unless this earthly mass was full of life, it is necessary, also, to assume universally, that holds are animated prior to parts, for it would be ridiculous that man indeed should participate of a rational soul and of intellect, but that no soul should be assigned to the earth and the air, supernally riding in, as it were, and governing the elements, and preserving them in their proper boundaries, for holes, as Theophrastus says, would have less authority than parts, and perpetual than corruptible natures, if they were destitute of soul. Hence, it is necessary to grant that a soul and an intellect are in the earth, the former causing it to be prolific, but the latter connectedly containing it in the middle of the universe. Earth herself, therefore, being a divine animal, is also a plenitude of intellectual and psychical essences, and of immaterial powers, for if a partial soul has besides a material body an immaterial vehicle, what ought we to think of a soul so divine as that of the earth, is it not, that by our much greater priority visible bodies are suspended from the soul through other vehicles as media, and that through these, the visible bodies are able to receive the illuminations of soul, such then being the nature of earth herself, she is said to be our nurse, in the first place, indeed, as possessing a power in a certain respect equivalent to heaven, for as that comprehends in itself divine animals, thus also. Earth is seen to contain terrestrial animals, but in the second place, she is our nurse, as inspiring our lives from her own proper life, for she not only produces fruits, and nourishes our bodies through these, but she also fills our souls with the illuminations of herself, for being a divine animal, and generating us who are partial animals, through her own body indeed she nourishes and connectedly contains our bulk, but from her own soul perfects ours, by her own intellect, likewise, she excites the intellect which is in us, and thus according to the whole of herself becomes the nurse of our whole composition. On this account it appears to me that Plato calls her our nurse, indicating by this her intellectual nutritive energy, for if she is our nurse, but we are truly souls and intellects, according to these especially, she will be the perfecter of our essence, moving and exciting our intellectual part, but being a divine animal, and comprehending in herself many partial animals, she is said by Plato to be conglobed about the pole which is extended through the universe, because she is contained and compressed about its axis, for the axis also is the pole, and the pole is thus now denominated, because the universe revolves about it. Because, however, the pole, properly so called, is impartable, but the axis is a pole with interval, just as if someone should say that a line is a flowing point, on this account, the pole is said by Plato to be extended through the universe, as entirely pervading through the center of the earth, but we must survey the poles as powers that give stability to the universe, exciting indeed the whole bulk of it to intelligible love, and impartably connecting that which is partable and unitedly and without interval that which is extended by interval. Hence, also, Plato in the Republic, makes a spindle of lachesis of adamant, indicating, as we have said, their inflexible and untamed power, 
and we must consider the axis, as that one divinity which collects the centers of the universe, which is connective of the whole world, and motive of the divine circulations, and as that about which holes dance and are convolved, and as sustaining all heaven, being on this account denominated Atlas, as possessing an immutable and unwearied energy, the word Tetamenon. Also, or extended, used here by Plato, indicates that this one power is titanic, guarding the circulations of holes. But if, as the divine Jamblichus says, we understand by the pole extended through the universe, the heavens, neither thus shall we wander from the conception of Plato, for, as Plato says in the Cratylus, those who are skilled in astronomy call the heavens the pole, as harmoniously revolving, according to this conception, therefore, you may call heaven the pole extended through the universe, as being incurvated through the whole of itself, in consequence of being without an angle. For after this manner the superficies of a circle is extended, about this, however, earth is conglobed, not locally, but through a desire of becoming assimilated to it, converging to the middle, in order that as heaven is moved about the center, so she by tending to the center, may become similar to that which is essentially spherical, being herself as much as possible conglobed. And she is compressed about the heaven in such a way as to be wholly extended about it. According to each of these conceptions, therefore, Plato delivers the cause through which earth is contained in the middle, for the axis is a power connective of the earth, and the earth is on all sides compressed by the circulation of the heaven, and is collected together into the center of the universe. Earth, therefore, being such, Timorus afterwards clearly shows what utility she affords to the universe, for he calls her the guardian and artificer of day and night, and indeed that she is the maker of night, is evident, for she produces a conical shadow, and her magnitude and figure, are the causes of the dimension and quality of the figure of this shadow, but after what manner is she likewise the fabricator of day? Or does she not produce this day which is conjoined with night, for about her the risings and settings of the sun are surveyed, and that Plato assumes this day which is convolved with night, is evident from his arranging the former under the latter, as also prior to this, when he says, night therefore and day were thus generated, earth, therefore, is the fabricator of both these, producing both in conjunction with the sun, the sun indeed being in a greater degree the cause of day, but the earth of night, being, however, the fabricator, she is also the guardian of them, preserving their boundaries and contrariety with reference to each other, and also their augmentations and diminutions, according to a certain analogy, hence, some denominate her Isis, as equalizing the inequality, and bringing to an analogy the increase and decrease of both day and night, but others looking to her prolific power call her res, as Plotinus, who denominates the intellect of the earth Vesta, but the soul of its res. We, however, say that the first causes of these divinities are intellectual, ruling and liberated, but that from these causes illuminations and powers extend to the earth. Hence there is a terrestrial res and Vesta, and a terrestrial Isis, in the same manner as there is a terrestrial Jupiter, and a terrestrial Hermes, these terrene deities being arranged about the one divinity of the earth, just as our multitude of celestial gods proceeds about the one divinity of the heavens, for there are progressions and terminations of all the celestial gods into the earth, and all things are in her terrestrially which are contained in the heavens celestially, for the intellectual earth receives the paternal powers of heaven, and contains all things after a generative manner, thus, therefore, we say that there is a terrestrial Bacchus, and a terrestrial Apollo, who is the source of prophetic waters in many parts of the earth, and of openings which predict future events, 
but the Paeonian and judicial powers which proceed into it, render other places of it of a purifying or medicinal nature, all the other powers of the earth, however, it is impossible to enumerate, for divine powers are indeed inexplicable, but the orders of angels and demons that follow these powers are still more numerous, and are circularly allotted the whole earth, and dance round its one divinity, its one intellect, and one soul. Chapters Xue. It remains in the next place, that we should survey how the earth is said to be the most ancient, and the first of the gods within the heavens, for this will be taken literally by those who are accustomed to look only to its material, gross and dark bulk, but we indeed grant them that there is something of such a kind in the bulk of the earth as they say there is, but we think it proper that they should likewise look to the other goods of the earth, through which it surpasses the prerogatives of the other elements, visit stability, its generative power, its concord with the heavens, and its position in the center of the universe, for the center has great power in the universe, as being connective of every circulation, hence also the Pythagoreans call the center the Tower of Jupiter, in consequence of containing in itself a demiurgic God. We shall likewise remind our opponents of the Platonic hypothesis concerning the earth, mentioned by Socrates in the Phaedo, where he says that the place of our abode is hollow and dark, and bound by the sea, but that there is another true earth, containing the receptacles of the gods, and possessing a beauty resembling that of the heavens. We ought not, therefore, to wonder if now the earth is said to be the most ancient and the first of the gods within the heavens, since she possesses so great an altitude, and such a surpassing beauty, and as Socrates afterwards says, was fashioned by the Demiurgus resembling a sphere covered with twelve skins, just as the heaven is similar to a dodecahedron, we must likewise understand that the Demiurgus gave to the earth alone among the elements to have all the elements separately, causing her to be wholly a world, variegated analogous to the heavens, for she contains a river of fire, of air, and of water, and of another earth which has the same relation to her which she has to the universe, as Socrates says in the Phaedo, but if this be the case, she very much transcends the other elements as imitating the heavens, and possessing every thing in herself terrestrially, which is celestially contained in the heavens, to this also we may add, that the Demiurgus produced these two elements the first, earth and fire, but the others for the sake of these, in order that they might have the ratio of bonds with respect to them, and that the four elements are both in the heavens, and in the sublunary region, but in the former, indeed, according to a fiery characteristic, since fire there predominates, as Plato says, but in the latter according to a terrestrial peculiarity, for the profundity of air, and the bulk of water are spread round the earth, and possess much of an earthly property, on which account they are in their own nature dark, in the heavens, therefore, there is a predominance of fire, but in the sublunary region of earth, since, however, generation is connoissantly conjoined with the heavens, the end of the latter is earth, so far as earth is in the heavens, but the beginning of generation is fire considered as subsisting in generation, for it is usual to call the moon earth, as having the same ratio to the sun, which earth has to fire, but, the Demiurgus, says Orpheus, fabricated another infinite earth, which the immortals call Selene, but terrestrials mean. And it is usual to denominate the summit of generation fire, which Aristotle also does, when he calls ether fire. In another place, however, he does not think it proper to call ether fire, but fiery formed. Hence, the end of the heavens is not entirely destitute of mutation, in consequence of its propinquity to generation, but the beginning of generation is moved in a circle imitating the heavens. Farther still, this likewise must be considered, 
that we ought not to judge of the dignity of things from places, but from powers and essence, by what peculiarities, therefore, are we to form a judgment of transcendencies, by what others than those which the divine orders exhibit, for transcendency truly so called is with the gods, from the divine orders, therefore, we must assume the monadic, the stable, the all-perfect, the prolific, the connective, the perfective, the every way extended, the vivific, the adorning, the assimilative, and the comprehending power, for these are the peculiarities of all the divine orders, according to all these however, the earth surpasses the other elements, so that she may justly be called the most ancient, and the first of the gods. Again, a twofold nature of things may be surveyed, the one indeed according to progression, which always makes things that have a secondary arrangement subordinate to those that are prior to them, but the other according to conversion, which conjoins extremes to primary natures through similitude, and produces one circle of the whole generation, since also the world is spherical, but a figure of this kind is the peculiarity of things that subsist according to conversion, earth likewise must be conjoined in it to the heavens, through one circle, and one similitude, for thus also the center is most similar to the poles, for the heavens indeed entirely comprehend holes, being moved about the poles, but the earth is allotted permanency in the center, for it is appropriate to generation that the immovable should be more ancient than that which is moved, hence, according to all these conceptions it may be said, that earth as coordinate with heaven, is the most ancient of the gods within the heavens, for she is within them, as being on all sides comprehended by them, for as the demiurgus fashioned the whole of a corporeal nature within the soul of the world, thus also he fabricated earth within the heavens, as compressed and contained by them, and in conjunction with them fabricating holes, she has, however, so far as she is the first of the gods, an indication of transcendency according to essence, but so far as she is the most ancient, she exhibits to our view the dignity which she is allotted, for how is it possible not to admit that she is allotted a great portion in the world, and is very honorable, in whom there are the Tower of Jupiter, and the progression of Saturn, for not only Tartarus, which is the extremity of the earth is on all sides comprehended by Saturn, and the Saturnian power, but also whatever else may be conceived subordinate to this, for Homer says that this is connectedly contained through the sub-Tartarian gods, not that he arranges gods beyond Tartarus, as the words indicate, but that Tartarus itself is on all sides comprehended by them, farther still, we may survey the analogy which earth has to the intellectual earth. For as the latter comprehends and gives subsistence to perfective, guardian, and titanic orders of gods, of which the Orphic theologies are full, so likewise the former possesses various powers, and as a nurse indeed she imitates the perfective order, according to which the Athenians also are accustomed to call her Purotrophos, or the nourisher of youth, and Anisidora or scattering gifts, as producing and nourishing plants and animals, but as a guard she imitates the garden, and as conglobed about the pole which is extended Tetameni. through the universe, the titanic order, since, however, the intellectual earth prior to other divinities generated Eagle and the Hesperian Erythia, thus also our earth is the fabricator of day and night and the analogy of the latter to the former is evident, in the last place, Proclus adds, if also you are willing after another manner to understand that she is the first and most ancient of the gods, as deriving her subsistence from the first and most ancient causes, this reason also will be attended with probability, since first causes proceed by their energies to the utmost extent of things, and besides this, the last of things frequently preserve the analogy of such as are firsts, 
as possessing their order from them alone. Hence, every way the assertion of Plato is true, whether you're willing to look to the bulk of the earth, or to the powers which she contains, and thus much from Proclus, concerning that great man. Dame Divinity, the earth, who in the language of Theophrastus, 33, is the common vesta of gods and men, and on whose fertile surface reclining, says he, as on the soft bosom of a mother or a nurse, we ought to celebrate her divinity with hymns, and incline to her with filial affection, as to the source of our existence. Capta XXEV. Having thus amply discussed the theory pertaining to the celestial gods, it is necessary in the next place, that we should direct our attention to the sublunary deities, who are denominated Yenesiurgi, or the fabricators of generation. Plato in the Timors calls these gods daemons, because they are so with reference to the celestial gods, for they are suspended from them, and together with them providentially attend to their appropriate allotments, conformably to this, also, in the banquet he calls love a daemon, as being the attendant of Venus, and as proceeding from the god Porus, who is truly the source of abundance, though in the Phaedrus he admits love to be a god, as with reference to the life of which he is the leader. What Plato, therefore, says of these gods in the Timors is as follows. But to speak concerning the other daemons, and to know their generation, is a task beyond our ability to perform. It is, therefore, necessary in this case to believe in ancient men, who being the progeny of the gods, as they themselves assert, must have a clear knowledge of their parents. It is impossible, therefore, not to believe in the children of the gods, though they should speak without probable unnecessary arguments but as they declare that their narrations are about affairs to which they are naturally allied, it is proper that complying with the law, we should assent to their tradition. In this manner then, according to them, the generation of these gods is to be described, that ocean and Tethys were the progeny of heaven and earth, that from hence forces, Saturn, and Rhea, and such as subsist together with these, were produced, that from Saturn and Rhea, Jupiter, Juno, and all such as we know are called the brethren of these descended, and lastly others, which are reported to be the progeny of these, Proclus, in his usual admirable manner, copiously elucidates these words of Plato, and in his comment fully unfolds the theory of the sublunary gods, but unfortunately there are many chasms in some of the most important parts of his elucidations, which no critical acumen, nor sagacious conjecture, can fully supply. I shall endeavour, however, to extract from his commentary, in the best manner I am able, all the information on this subject which can at present be derived from this invaluable work, occasionally attempting to restore the sense, where from the mutilated state of the original it is wanting. Plato then, Intending now to speak of the sublunary gods, says, that the discourse about them is admirable, and beyond our ability to perform, if we intend to discover the generation of them, and promulgate it to others, for what he before said of the Demiurgus, that it is difficult to discover him, and impossible to speak of him to all men, this he now says of the sublunary gods that to know and to speak of the generation of them, surpasses our ability. What, therefore, does Plato mean by this mode of indication, for as he has delivered so many and such admirable things concerning all heaven, and the intelligible paradigm, how is it that he says, that to speak of the gods who are the fabricators of generation, is a task beyond our ability to perform, perhaps it is because many Physiologists consider these sublunary elements to be inanimate natures casually borne along, and destitute of providential care, for they acknowledge that the celestial bodies, on account of their orderly motions, participate of intellect and the gods, but they left generation, as being very mutable and indefinite, 
deprived of providential inspection, in order, therefore, that we might not be affected in the same manner as they were, he antecedently celebrates and proclaims the generation of the sublunary gods to be divine and intellectual, requiring no such mode of indication in speaking of the celestial gods, perhaps also it may be said, that souls more swiftly forget things nearer to themselves, but have a greater remembrance of superior principles, for they in a greater degree operate upon them through transcendency of power, and appear through energy to be present with them. The same thing also happens with respect to our sight, for though we do not see many things that are situated on the earth, yet at the same time we appear to see the inner attic sphere, and the stars themselves, because they illuminate our sight with their light. The eye of the soul, therefore, becomes in a greater degree oblivious of, and blind to, more proximate than, to higher and more divine principles. Thus, all religions and sects acknowledge that there is a first principle of things, and all men invoke God as their helper, but all do not believe that there are gods posterior to this principle, and that a providential energy proceeds from them into the universe for the one is seen by them in a clearer manner than multitude. Others, again, believe indeed that there are gods, but after the gods, admitting the demoniacal genus, they are ignorant of the heroic order. And in short, this is the greatest work of science, subtly to distinguish the media and the progressions of beings. If, therefore, we rightly assert these things, Plato, when speaking of the celestial gods, very properly indicates nothing of the difficulty of the subject, but when speaking of the sublunary gods, says that it surpasses our ability, for the discussion of these is more difficult, because we cannot collect anything about them from apparent objects, but it alone requires a divinely inspired energy, and intellectual projection, and thus much concerning this doubt. Again, though we have assigned a reason why Plato calls the sublunary gods demons, we may likewise say according to another conception, that in the celestial regions there are demons, and in the sublunary, gods, but that in the form of the genus is indeed divine, though demons also are generated according to it, and that in the latter the whole multitude are demons, for there indeed, the divine peculiarity, but here the demoniacal predominates, to which some atone looking, have divided the divine and the demoniacal, according to the heavens and generation. They ought however, to have arranged both in both, but in the former indeed the divine nature, and in the latter the demoniacal predominates, though in the former there is also the divine peculiarity, for if the whole world is a blessed God. No one of the parts which give completion to it is destitute of divinity, and providential inspection. But if all things participate of deity and providence, the world is allotted a divine nature. And if this be the case, appropriate orders of gods preside over its different parts. For if the heavens through souls and intellects as media participate of one soul, and one intellect, what ought we to think of these sublunary elements? How is it possible, that these should not in a much greater degree participate through certain middle divine orders, of the one deity of the world? Farther still, it would also be absurd that the telestic art, or the art pertaining to mystic ceremonies, should establish on the earth places fitted for oracles, and statues of the gods and through certain symbols should cause things generated from a partial and corruptible matter, to become adapted to the participation of deity, to be moved by him, and to predict future events, but that the demiurgus of holes, should not place over the whole elements which are the incorruptible plenitudes of the world, divine souls, intellects and gods, for whether was he unwilling, but how could he be unwilling? since he wished to make all things similar to himself, was he then unable, but what could hinder him, for we see that this is possible from telestic works, but if he was both willing and able, 
it is evident that he gave subsistence to gods, who have allotments in, and are the inspective guardians of generation, since however the genus of Damons is everywhere an attendant on the gods, there are also Damons who are the fabricators of generation, some of whom indeed rule over the whole elements, but others are the guardians of climates, others are the rulers of nations, others of cities, others of certain families, and others are the guardians of individuals, for the guardianship of Damons extends as for us to the most extreme division. Chapter XXV. Having therefore solved the problem pertaining to the essence, let us in the next place consider the order of the sublunary gods, and the meaning of the subsequent words of Plato, for let them be gods, and let them be called Damons for the cause above assigned, where must we arrange them, must it be, as we have before said, under the moon, or prior to the celestial gods, for this may appear to be proper for these two reasons, one indeed, because Plato indicates that he ascends to a greater order, by saying that it exceeds our ability to speak concerning them, having already spoken concerning the celestial gods, but the other, because he follows in what he says, those who have delivered to us the Argonis, for they prior to the world in the Demiurgus, delivered these generations of gods proceeding from heaven and earth. In answer to this query however, we must say, that he produces them after the celestial gods, and through this from heaven and earth, for on this account he said that earth was the most ancient of the gods within the heaven, because from this and heaven, he was about to produce the other gods which the heavens contain, this we demonstrate from the Demiurgus addressing his speech to these gods, and to all the rest as being produced by him within the universe, why, however, Plato says that he follows the theogony, and why he shall omit to speak concerning the sublunary deities, we must refer to his having no clear indications of the subsistence of these from the phenomena, as he had of the celestial divinities, from the order of their periods, which is adapted to the government of gods. It exceeds the province therefore of physiology to speak of beings, concerning whom natural effects afford us no stable belief. Hence Plato says, as a physiologist, that it surpasses his ability to speak of these. If, however, he says that he follows those who are divinely inspired, but they speaking concerning the super-celestial gods, he adopts a similar theogony. Though discoursing of the subcelestial divinities, we must not consider this as wonderful, for he knew that all the orders of the gods, proceed as far as to the last of things, from the arrangement which is the principle of their progression, everywhere gen. Aerating series from themselves analogous to the superior deities from which they proceed, hence, though the orders of these gods which are celebrated by theologists, are above the world, yet they subsist also in the sensible universe, and as this visible heaven is allied to that which is supermundane, so likewise our earth is allied to the earth which is there, and the order subsisting from the one to the orders proceeding from the other, from these things too, this also may be assumed, that according to Plato as well as according to other theologists, first natures as they proceed produce things subordinate in conjunction with the causes of themselves, for these sublunary gods proceeding from the Demiurgus, are also said to be generated from heaven and earth that first proceed from him, the Demiurgus therefore says to all of them that they ought to fabricate mortal natures, imitating his power about their generation, hence all of them proceed from one producing cause, though those of a secondary order proceed likewise from the gods that are prior to them. It follows therefore from this, that not everything which is produced by the junior gods is mortal, since some of these proceed from other junior gods, but the contrary alone. is true, that everything mortal is generated by these divinities, and again, it follows from this, that the junior gods produce some things according to the immovable but others according to the movable hypoxes of themselves, 
for they would not be the causes of immortals, if they produced all things according to movable hypoxes, if it be true that everything which subsists from a movable cause, is essentially immutable, again, when Plato says, it is therefore necessary to believe in ancient men, who being the progeny of the gods as they themselves assert, must have a clear knowledge of their parents, for it is impossible not to believe in the children of the gods, though they should speak without probable unnecessary arguments, we may collect from this, that he who simply believes in things which seem difficult to be known, and which are of a dubious nature, runs in the paths of abundance, recurring to divine knowledge, and deific intelligence, through which all things become apparent and known, for all things are contained in the gods, but that which antecedently comprehends all things, is likewise able to fill other things with the knowledge of itself, hence, Timos here sends us to Thealo. Gists, and to the generation of the gods celebrated by them, who therefore are they, and what is their knowledge, they indeed are the progeny of the gods, and clearly know their progenitors, being the progeny and children of the gods, as preserving the form of their presiding deity according to the present life, for Apolloniacal souls, in consequence of choosing a prophetic, or telestic life, are called the children and progeny of Apollo, children indeed, so far as they are souls pertaining to this god, and adapted to this series, but progeny because they demonstrate their present life to be conformable to these characteristics of the god, all souls therefore, are the children of the gods, but all do not know their presiding god, such however, as have this knowledge and chose a similar life are called the children and progeny of the gods, hence Plato adds, as they say for they unfold the order from which they came, thus a Sibyl, 34, as soon as she was born, uttered oracles, and Hercules appeared at his birth with demiurgic symbols, but souls of this kind convert themselves to their progenitors, and are filled from them with deific knowledge, their knowledge however, is enthusiastic being conjoined to deity through divine light, and exempt from all other knowledge, both that which is probable, and that which is demonstrative, for the former is conversant with nature, and the universal in particulars, but the latter with an incorporeal essence, and the objects of science, divinely inspired knowledge however, alone, is conjoined with the gods themselves, Timors or in other words Plato, afterwards adds, but as they declare that their narrations are about affairs, to which they are naturally allied, it is proper that complying with the law, we should assent to their tradition from these words, he who considers them accurately may assume many things, such as that divinely inspired knowledge is perfected through familiarity with and alliance to the gods, for the sun is seen through solar form light, and divinity becomes apparent through divine illumination, it may likewise be inferred that the divine law defines the orders of the gods which the divinely inspired conceptions of the ancients unfold, according to which also souls energizing, though not enthusiastically, are persuaded by those that enthusiastically energize, complying with this law. Timos in the beginning of this dialogue says that he shall invoke the gods and goddesses, from these words also we may infer, that all the kingdoms both in the heavens and the sublunary region, are adorned and distributed in order, according to the first and intellectual principles, and that all of them are everywhere according to the analogous, likewise that the order of things precedes our conceptions but it is Pythagoric to follow the Orphic genealogies, for the science concerning the gods proceeded from the Orphic tradition through Pythagoras, to the Greeks, as Pythagoras himself says in the Sacred Discourse. Chapter XXVI. Again then, following Proclus, we say that the theory of the sublunary is immediately connected with that of the celestial gods, and in consequence of being suspended from it, possesses the perfect and the scientific, for the generation produce inquire of gods, 
follows the gods in the heavens, and in imitation of the celestial circle, convolves also the circle in generation, for secondary follow the natures prior to them, according to an indivisible and united progression, because however, the divinities that govern generation, subsist immediately from the celestial gods, on this account also. They are converted to them according to one undisjoined union, just as the celestial are converted to the super-celestial deities, from whom they were proximately generated, but the super-celestial to the intellectual, by whom they were adorned and distributed, and again the intellectual to the intelligible gods, from whom they were ineffably unfolded into light, and who indescribably and occultly comprehend all things, of the whole of this truly golden chain therefore, the summit is indeed the genus of the intelligible gods, but the end is that of the sublunary deities, who govern generation in an unbegotten, and nature in a supernatural manner, to which the demiurgic intellect now gives subsistence, the dominion of the gods extending supernally from the heavens, as far as to the last of things, of these sublunary deities however, it is necessary to observe in the first place, that all of them preserve the generative and perfective energy of their generating cause, and also his demiurgic and stable productive power, they likewise receive measures, boundaries, and order from their father, and such things as he governs exemptly and totally, they being divided according to allotments, fabricate, gen, erit, and perfect. Some of them also approximate to the celestial gods, but others proceed to a greater distance from them, hence, some preserve the idea of these gods, so far as it can be preserved in the sublunary order, but others are established according to their appropriate power, for of every order, the summit is analogous to the order prior to it, thus the summit of intelligibles is unity, of intellectuals is intelligible of the supermundane order, is intellectual, and of the mundane order, supermundane, and some of the sublunary gods indeed, are in a greater degree united to the demiurgic monad, but others are more distant from it, hence, some being analogous to it, are the leaders of the whole of this series, but others have a more partial similitude to it for the father established in every order powers analogous to him in their arrangement since in all the divine orders a certain cause pre-subsists analogous to the good, conformably to these causes which are thus analogous to the ineffable principle of things, and which with reference to it are called monads, the sublunary gods proceed, and adorn and distribute generation in a becoming manner, and some indeed, give completion to this, but others to some other will of their father, for some complete is connective, Others is prolific, others is motive, others is guardian will, and others, some other will of the demiurgus pertaining to the holes in the sublunary region, and some of them have dominion over souls, others over demons, and others over gods. All of them however are intellectual according to essence, but mundane according to allotment. They are also perfective, and powerful governing generation in an unbegotten manner, beings deprived of intellect, intellectually, and inanimate natures, vitally, for they adorn all things according to their own essence, and not according to the imbecility of the recipients. But Plato is evidently of opinion that these gods use certain other bodies more simple and perpetual than these elements by saying, that they appear when they please and become visible to us that he likewise gives them souls is manifest from his saying that every mundane god is conjoined to bodies through soul, for he then first called the world itself a god, when he had established a soul in it, and again that he suspends intellect from them, through which their souls are intellectual, and are immediately converted to the demiurgus, is evident from the speech of the demiurgus to them. If likewise it is requisite that the whole world should be perfect, it is necessary that together with the divine genera we should conceive that the daemoniacal order was generated prior to our souls, 
and which receives a triple division, viz. into angels, demons properly so called and heroes, for the whole of this order fills up the middle space between gods and men, because there is an all perfect separation or interval between our concerns, and those of the gods, for the latter are eternal, but the former are frail and mortal and the former indeed are satisfied with the enjoyment of intellect in energy partially, but the latter ascend into total intellects themselves, on this accounts there is a triad which conjoins our concerns with the gods, and which proceeds, analogous to the three principal causes of things, though Plato is accustomed to call the whole of this triad ammoniacal, for the angelic is analogous to being, or the intelligible which is first unfolded into light from the ineffable and occult fountain of beings, hence also, it unfolds the gods themselves, and announces that which is occult in their essence, but the daemoniacal is analogous to infinite life, on which account it proceeds everywhere according to many orders, and is of a multiform nature, and the heroic is analogous to intellect and conversion. Hence also, it is the inspective guardian of purification, and is the supplier of a magnificent and elevated life. Farther still, the angelic indeed proceeds according to the intellectual life of the demiurgus. Hence it also is essentially intellectual, and interprets, and transmits a divine intellect to secondary natures. But the demoniacal proceeds according to the demiurgic providence of wholes governs nature, and rightly gives completion to the order of the whole world, and the heroic again proceeds according to the convertive providence of all these, hence, this genus likewise is elevated, raises souls on high, and is the cause of a grand and vigorous energy, such therefore being the nature of these triple genera, they are suspended from the gods, some ended from the celestial gods but others from the divinities who are the inspective guardians of generation, and about every god there is an appropriate number of angels, heroes and demons, for every god is the leader of a multitude which receives his characteristic form, hence of the celestial gods, the angels, demons and heroes are celestial, but of the fabricators of generation, they have a generation producing characteristic, of the elevating gods, they have an elevating property, but of the demiurgic, a demiurgic, of the vivifier of a vific property, and so of the rest, and again, among the elevating gods, of those that are of a Saturnian characteristic, the angels, demons, and heroes are Saturnian, but of those that are solar, they are solar. Among the vivific gods likewise of those that are lunar, the ministrant powers are lunar, but of the aphrodisiacal, or those that have the characteristic of Venus, they are aphrodisiacal, for they bear the names of the gods from whom they are suspended, as being in connected continuity with them, and receiving one and the same idea with an appropriate subjection, nor is this wonderful, since partial souls also when they know their patron, and leading gods, call themselves by their names, or whence were the Escalapuses, the Bacuses, and the Dioscuri denominated, who being men of an heroic character, took the names of the deities from whom they descended, 35, as therefore, of the celestial, as likewise of the gods who are the fabricators of generation, it is necessary to survey about each of them a coordinate angelical, demoniacal, and heroical multitude, and that the number suspended from them retains the appellation of its producing monad, hence, there is a celestial god, angel and hero, and the like is also true of the earth, in a similar manner we must say that ocean and tethys proceed into all the orders, and conformably to this the other gods, for there is likewise a Jovian, a Junonian, and a Saturnian multitude, which is called by the same appellation of life, nor is there any absurdity, in calling man both the intelligible and the sensible man, though in these, there is a much greater separation and interval, 
and thus much in common concerning the gods and demons who are the fabricators of generation. Chapter XXVII. It now remains to show what conceptions we ought to have of the gods mentioned by Plato in the passage before cited from the Timaeus. For of the ancients, some referred what is said about them to fables, others to the fathers of cities, others to guardian powers, others to ethical explanations, and others to souls. These, however, are sufficiently confuted by the divine Jamblichus, who demonstrates that they wander from the meaning of Plato, and from the truth of things. After this manner, therefore, we must say, that Samos being a Pythagorean, follows the Pythagorean principles, but these are the Orphic traditions, for what Orphis delivered mystically through arcane narrations, these Pythagoras learned, being initiated by Ophimus in the mystic wisdom which Orphis derived from his mother Calliope, for these things Pythagoras says in the sacred discourse, what then are the Orphic traditions? since we are of opinion that the doctrine of Timos about the gods should be referred to these, they are as follow, Orpheus delivered the kingdoms of the gods who preside over holes, according to a perfect number, vis fanes, night, heaven, Saturn, Jupiter, Bacchus, for fanes is the first that bears a scepter, and the first king is the celebrated Erechopos, but the second is night, who receives a scepter from her father, Fanes, the third is Heaven, who receives it from night, the fourth is Saturn, who, as they say, offered violence to his father, the fifth is Jupiter, who subdued his father, and after him, the sixth is Bacchus, all these kings, therefore, beginning supernally from the intelligible and intellectual gods, proceed through the middle orders, and into the world that they may adorn mundane affairs, for fanes is not only in intelligibles, but also in intellectuals, in the demiurgic, and in the supermundane order, and in a similar manner, heaven and night, for the peculiarities of them proceed through all the middle orders, and with respect to the mighty Saturn, is he not arranged prior to Jupiter, and does he not after the Jovian kingdom? divide the Bacchic fabrication in conjunction with the other titans, and this indeed, he effects in one way in the heavens, and in another in the sublunary region, in one way in the inner attic sphere, and in another among the planets, and in a similar manner Jupiter and Bacchus. These things, therefore, are clearly asserted by the ancients. If, however we are right in these assertions, these divinities have everywhere an analogous subsistence, and he who wishes to survey the progressions of them into the heavens, or the sublunary region, should look to the first and principal causes of their kingdoms, for from thence, and according to them, their generation is derived. Some, therefore, say, that Plato omits to investigate the gods who are analogous to the two kings in the heavens, I mean fanes and night for it is necessary to place them in a superior order, and not among the mundane gods, because prior to the world, they are the leaders of the intellectual gods, being eternally established in the Aditum, as Orpheus says of Fanes, who by the word Aditum signifies their occult and immanifest order, whether, therefore, we refer the circulation, of same and different, mentioned by Plato in this dialogue, to the analogy of these, as male and female, or paternal and generative, we shall not wander from the truth, or whether we refer the sun and moon, as opposed to each other, among the planets, to the same analogy, we shall not err, for the sun indeed through his light preserves a similitude to fanes, but the moon to night, Jupiter, or the Demiurgus, in the intellectual, is analogous to Fanes in the intelligible order, and the vivific crater Juno is analogous to Night, who produces all life in conjunction with Fanes from unapparent causes, just as Juno is parturient with, and emits into light, all the soul contained in the world, for it is better to conceive both these as prior to the world, 
and to arrange the demiurgus himself as analogous to Fanes, since he is said to be assimilated to him according to the production of holes, but to arrange the power conjoined with Jupiter, I. E. Juno, and which is generative of holes, tonight, who produces all things from the father Fanes, after these, however, we must consider the remaining, as analogous to the intellectual kingdoms, if, likewise, it should be asked why Plato does not mention the kingdoms of Fanes and Night, to whom we have said Jupiter and Juno are analogous, it may be readily answered, that the tradition of Orphis contains these, on which account Plato celebrates the kingdom of heaven and earth was the first, the Greeks being more accustomed to this than to the Orphic traditions, as he himself says in the Cratylus, where he particularly mentions the Theogony of Hesiod, and recurs as far as to this kingdom according to that poet, beginning, therefore, from this Theogony is more known, and assuming heaven and earth as the first kingdoms above the world. He produces the visible heaven and earth analogous to those in the intellectual order, and celebrates the latter as the most ancient of the gods within the former. From these also, he begins the theogony of the sublunary gods. These things, however, if divinity pleases, will be manifest from what follows. At present we shall only add, that it is requisite to survey all these names divinely or damoniacally and according to the allotments of these divinities in the four elements, for the Sinead is in ether and water, in earth and in air, all variously, according to the divine, and also according to the damoniacal peculiarity, and again, these names are to be surveyed aquatically and aerially, and likewise in the earth terrestrially, in order that all of them may be everywhere, according to an all various mode of subsistence. For there are many modes of providence divine and damoniacal, and many allotments according to the division of the elements. Chapter XXVIII. Let us, therefore, now return to the words of Plato. In the first place then he says that ocean and Tethys were the progeny of heaven and earth. And here we may observe, that as this whole world is ample and various, as adumbrating the intellectual order of forms, it contains these two extremities in itself, earth and heaven, the latter having the relation of a father, but the former of a mother. On this account Plato calls earth the most ancient of the gods within the heavens, in order that conformably to this he might say, that earth is the mother of all that. Heaven is the father, at the same time evincing that partial causes are not only subordinate to their progeny, as poverty, in the banquet of Plato to love, but are likewise superior to them, as alone receiving the offspring proceeding from the fathers, these two extremities, therefore, must be conceived in the world, heaven as the father, and earth as the mother of her common progeny, for all the rest terminate in these, some giving completion to the celestial number, but others to the wholeness of earth, after the same manner, Likewise, in each of the elements of the world, these two principles, heaven and earth, must be admitted, subsisting aerially indeed in air, but aquatically in water, and terrestrially in earth, and according to all the above, mentioned modes, in order that each may be a perfect world, adorned and distributed from analogous principles, for if man is said to be a microcosm, is it not necessary that each of the elements by a much greater priority should contain in itself appropriately all that the world contains totally? Hence, it appears to me that Plato immediately after speaking about heaven and earth, delivers the theory of these gods, beginning from those two divinities, for the other divinities proceed analogous to heaven and earth. These two divinities, however, are totally the causes of all the gods that are now produced, and these divinities that are the progeny of heaven and earth, are analogous to the whole of each. These two, likewise, as we have before observed, are in each of the elements, aerially, or aquatically, or terrestrially, for heaven is in earth, and earth in heaven, 36, and here, 
Indeed, heaven subsists terrestrially, but there earth celestially, for Orpheus calls the moon celestial earth, nor is it proper to wonder that this should be the case, for we may survey the same things everywhere, according to the analogous, in intelligibles, in intellectuals, in the supermundane order, in the heavens, and in generation, conformably to the proper order of each, with respect, however, to each of these divinities, some of the interpreters of Plato understand by earth, this solid bulk which is the object of sensible inspection, others as that which has an arrangement analogous to matter, and is supposed to exist prior to generated natures, others, as intelligible matter, others, as the power of intellect, others, as life, others, as an incorporeal form inseparable from earth, others conceive it to be soul, and others intel. Lect, in a similar manner with respect to heaven, some suppose it to be the visible heavens, others, the motion about the middle of the universe, others, power aptly proceeding in conjunction with motion, others, that which possesses intellect, others a pure and separate intellect, others, the nature of circulation, others, soul, and others, intellect. I know, likewise, that the divine Jamblichus understands by earth, everything stable and firm, according to the essence of the mundane gods, and which according to energy and a perpetual circulation, comprehends more excellent powers and total lives, but by heaven, he understands the total and perfect energy proceeding from the Demiurgus, which is full of appropriate power, and subsists about the Demiurgus, as being the boundary of itself and of wholes. I know, likewise, that the admirable Theodorus establishes both these powers in the life which subsists according to habitude, in order, however, that we may avoid erroneous opinions and may adhere to the most pure conceptions of Jamblichus, and the traditions of Serenus, it is necessary in the first place to recollect, that Plato is now speaking of the sublunary gods, that all of them are every where, and that they proceed according to the analogy of the intelligible and intellectual kings, and in the second place we must say, that as the first heaven is the boundary of and connectedly contains the intellectual gods, containing the measure which proceeds from the good and the intelligible gods, into the intellectual orders, after the same manner the heaven which is now mentioned by Plato, is the boundary and container of the gods that are the fabricators of generation, comprehending in one bound the demiurgic measure and also that which proceeds from the celestial gods to those divinities that are allotted the realms of generation, and connecting them with the celestial government of the gods, for as the Demiurgus is to the good itself, so is the one divinity of this heaven, to the intellectual heaven, hence, as their, measure and bound proceeds from the good through heaven to all the intellectual gods. So likewise here bound arrives to the god the fabricators of generation and to the more excellent genera, viz to angels, damons and heroes, from the Demiurgus, and the summit of the mundane gods, viz through the connectedly containing medium of this heaven, for the everywhere preceding heaven is allotted. This order, in one procession of things indeed, unitedly and occultly, but in another manifestly and separately, for in one order, it introduces bound to souls, in another to the works of nature, and in another in a different manner to other things, and in air indeed, it affects this primarily, but in the aquatic orders secondarily, and in earth, and terrestrial works, in an ultimate degree, but there are also complications of these, for the divine mode of subsistence, and also the demoniacal are different in the air, and in the earth, for in one place, the mode is the same in different orders, but in another the mode is different in one allotment, and thus much concerning the power of heaven. Chapter 6. In the next place, directing our attention to earth, 
we shall derive the whole of the theory concerning her from her first evolution into light. She first becomes manifest, therefore, in the middle triads of the intellectual gods, together with heaven who connectedly contains the whole intellectual order. She likewise proceeds analogous to the intelligible earth, which we find to be the first of the intelligible triads, and as ranking in the vivific orders, she is assimilated to the first infinity, but she is the receiving bosom of the generative deity of heaven, and the middle center of his paternal goodness. She also reigns together with him, and is the power of him who ranks as a father. The earth, however, which is analogous to her, and presides in the sublunary regions, is as it were the prolific power of the heaven pertaining to the realms of generation, unfolding into light his paternal, definitive, measuring and containing providence, which prolifically extends to all things. She likewise generates all the sublunary infinity, just as heaven who belongs to the coordination of bound, introduces termination and end to secondary natures, bound, therefore, and end define the hypoxis of everything according to which gods and demons, souls and bodies are connected and made to be one, imitating the one unity of wholes, or in other words, the ineffable principle of things. But infinity multiplies the powers of every being, for there is much bound in all sublunary natures, and likewise much infinity, which through divinity, and after the gods extends to all things. We have, therefore, these two orders, which are generative of the divine or demoniacal progressions, in all the sublunary genera and elements and one kingdom of them in the same manner as in the intellectual orders. From these, however, a second duad proceeds, Ocean and Tethys, this generation not being affected by copulation, nor by any conjunction of things separated, nor by division, nor according to a certain abscission. For all these are foreign from the gods but they are accomplished according to one union and indivisible conjunction of powers, and this union theologists are accustomed to call marriage, for marriage, as the theologist Orpheus says, is appropriate to this order, for he calls earth the first nymph, and the union of her with heaven the first marriage, since there is no marriage in the divinities that are in the most eminent degree united, hence there is no marriage between Fane's night, who are intelligibly united to each other, and marriage appears on this account to be adapted to the heaven and earth which we are at present considering, so far as they adumbrate the intellectual heaven and earth, which the sacred laws of the Athenians likewise knowing, ordered that the marriages of heaven and earth should be celebrated, as preparatory to initiation into the mysteries, directing their attention to these also, in the Eleusinian mysteries. Looking upward to the heavens, they exclaimed, O son but looking downward to the earth, O parent, according to this union, therefore, in conjunction with separation, heaven and earth produce through their goodness ocean and tethys, or rather, they do not immediately produce these, but prior to these two monads, two triads, and double hebdomads, among which are ocean and tethys, and the monads indeed together with the triads, remain with the father, but of the hebdomads, ocean, together with tethys, abide, and at the same time proceed, all the rests, however, proceed into another order of gods, and this indeed is the mode of their subsistence in the intellectual order, but here, Plato entirely omits the causes that abide in the father, but delivers to us those that proceed and at the same time abide because his intention is to speak of the gods that are the fabricators of generation. To these, however, progression, motion, and difference, are adapted, and a co-arrangement of the male with the female, in order that there may be generation, that matter may be adorned with forms, and that difference may be combined with sameness. Hence Plato commences from the duad, proceeds through it, and again returns to it for the duad is adapted to material natures, as well as difference, 
on account of the division of forms about matter, having mentioned the duad, likewise, he begins from earth, for this is more adapted to things pertaining to generation, with respect to these two divinities, however, ocean and Tethys, who abide in their causes and at the same time proceed from them, some say that ocean is a corporeal essence, others, that it is a swiftly pervading nature, others, that it is the motion of a humid essence, others, that it is ether, through the velocity of its motion, and others, that it is the intelligible profundity itself of life. The divine Jamblichus, however, defines it to be the middle motive divine cause, which middle souls, lives, and intellections, efficacious natures, and those elements that are pneumatic, such as air and fire, first participate, and with respect to Tethys, some say that it is a humid essence, others, that it is a very mutable nature, and others, that it is the hilarity of the universe, but the divine Jamblichus asserts it to be a productive power, possessing an energizing and efficacious establishment, the stable intellections of which, souls, natures, and powers participate, and which is likewise participated by certain solid receptacles, either of earth or water, which prepare a seat for the elements. We, however, again assuming our principles, say, that the causes of these are indeed in the intellectual gods, and that they are likewise in the sensible universe. For ocean everywhere distinguishes first from second orders, in consequence of which poets do not improperly call it the boundary of the earth. But the ocean which is now the subject of discussion, is the cause of motion, progression, and power, inserting in intellectual lives indeed, acme, and prolific abundance, but in souls, celerity and vigor, in their energies, and purity in their generations, and in bodies facility of motion, and in the gods indeed it imparts a motive and providential cause, but in angels an unfolding and intellectual celerity and vigor, again, in damons it is the supplier of efficacious power, but in heroes, of a magnificent and flourishing life, it likewise subsists in each of the elements, according to its characteristic peculiarity, hence, the aerial ocean is the cause of all the mutation of aerial natures, and of the circle of the meteors, as also Aristotle says, but the aquatic ocean gives subsistence to fertility, facility of motion, and all various powers, for according to the poets, from this all seasoned every river flow, and the terrestrial ocean is the producing cause of generative perfection, of the separation of forms, and of generation and corruption, whether also there are certain terrestrial orders, vivific and demiurgic, it is the source of their distinction, or whether there are powers connective of the productive principles of the earth, and the inspective guardians of generation, these also it excites and multiplies, and calls into motion, with respect to Tethys, as the name indeed evinces, she is the most ancient, and the progenitor, of the gods, in the same manner as it is fit to acknowledge of the mother ear, for theologists denominate another goddess prior to her, Maya, thus, Orpheus, Maya, of God supreme, immortal night, what mean you, say, but according to the etymology of Plato, she is a certain fontal deity, for the undefiled and pure, and that which percolates are signified through her name since ocean produces all things, and is the source of all motions, whence. Also it is called the generation of the gods, Tethys separates the unical cause of his motions into primary and secondary motions, hence Plato says, that she derives her appellation from leaping and percolating, for these are separative names, in the same manner, as he says in the Sophista. To card, and to separate threads in weaving with a shuttle, ocean, therefore, generating all motion collectively, whether divine, or intellectual, or psychical, 
or physical, teth is separating both internal and external motions, is so called from causing material motions to leap and be percolated from such as are immaterial, hence, the separating characteristic is adapted to the female, and the unical to the male, Plato, therefore, would assert such peculiarities as these, of ocean and tethys, and does assert them in the Cratylus, but according to the divine Jamblichus, tethys must be defined to be the supplier of position and firm establishment, from all that has been said, however, it may be summarily asserted that tethys is the cause of permanency, and a firm establishment of things in herself, separating them from the motions that proceed externally. In short, ocean is the cause of all motion, intellectual, psychical, and physical to all secondary natures, but tethys is the cause of all the separation of the streams proceeding from ocean, imparting to each a proper purity in the motion adapted to it by nature, through which each, though it may move itself, or though it may move other things, yet moves in a transcendent manner. But theologists manifest that ocean is the supplier of all motion, when they say that he sends forth ten streams, nine of which proceed into the sea, because it is necessary, that of motions nine should be corporeal, but that there should be one alone of the essence which is separate from bodies, as we are informed by Plato in the Laws, 37, such divine natures, therefore, as the mighty ocean generates, these he excites to motion, and renders them efficacious, but Tethys distinguishes these, preserving generative causes pure from their progeny, and establishing them in energies more ancient than those that proceed into the external world, and thus much concerning each of these divinities, ocean and Tethys, since, however, as we have said, the generation of these, is from the prior divinities, heaven and earth, but it's not affected either by a copulation such as that which is in sensibles, nor according to such a union as that of night and feigns in intelligibles, it very properly follows that their progeny are separated from each other, analogously to their parents, and that each receives a similitude to both, for ocean indeed, as being the male is assimilated to the paternal cause, heaven, but as the supplier of motion to the maternal cause, earth, who is the cause of progressions, and Tethys indeed, as the female, is assimilated to the prolific cause, but as producing a firm establishment of her progeny in their proper lives, she is assimilated to the fabricating cause, for the male is analogous to the monadic, but the female to the dyadic and the stable is adapted to the former, but the motive to the latter, a duad, therefore, proceeding from a duad, and being assimilated according to the whole of itself to the duad which is generative of it, defines and distinguishes the causes of itself, and all the number posterior to itself, in order that everywhere we may ascribe that which defines and separates, to the order of ocean and tethys. Chapter XXX. In the next place Plato says, that from motion and Tethys, forces, Saturn, and Rhea, and such as subsist together with these were produced, the theory of which divinities is as follows, in the former progeny, a due ad generative and motive, was produced from a terminating and definitive duad, viz ocean and Tethys, from heaven and earth, but in the second progeny, a multitude converted to its causes through the triad, is generated from the duad, indicating likewise an all-perfect progression, for this multitude also is divided, into the analogous to bound, and the coordinate to infinity, for the triad is the bound in this multitude, but the nameless number is the infinity in it, and of the triad itself, likewise, one thing is analogous to the monad and bound, but another to the duad and infinity, and in the former progression, indeed, the progeny alone proceeded according to bound and the intellectual, but in this there is also a mixture of the indefinite, but after the boundary from the triad, Plato adds, 
and such as subsist together with these indicating the entire progression and separation of these triple orders, so that the progeny of this progression is triadic through the peculiarity of conversion, and dyadic through the intervention of the infinite and indefinite, since, however, these differ according to their intellectual causes, in the same manner as the before mentioned orders, but in their motion and tethys were said to be the brethren, and not the fathers of Saturn and Rhea, for the progression to these was from heaven and earth, and all the titanic order is thence derived, let us see on what account Plato here gives subsistence to forces, Saturn and Rhea, from motion and tethys, for he may appear to say this not conformably to the Orphic principles, for earth latently bore from heaven, as the theologist says, seven pure beautiful virgins with rolling eyes, and seven sons that were kings, with fine long hair, and the daughters indeed were Themis, and the joyful Tethys, Memo sign with thick curled hair, and the blessed Thee, she likewise Bordion having a very graceful form, and Phobe, and Rhea the mother of King Jupiter, but the venerable earth brought forth those celestial youths, who are called by the appellation of Titans, because they revenge the mighty starry heaven, and she also bore Cors, the great cross, and the strong forces, and likewise Saturn, and Ocean, Hype, Rhen and Japotus, these things then having been written by the theologist prior to Plato, how is it that Timorce produces Saturn and Rhea, from Motion and Tethys, in answer to this, as we have before arranged Ocean and Tethys above Saturn and Rhea, as being the media between these and the fathers, and guardians of the boundaries of both, as it is usual to celebrate them, we must say in the first place, indeed, that it's not wonderful that the same divinity should be brothers, and yet through transcendency of dignity should be called the fathers of certain gods, for such things as are firsts, when they proceed from their causes, producing conjunction with those causes, the natures posterior to themselves, thus all souls indeed are sisters, according to one demiurgic cause, and according to the vivific principle and fountain from which they proceed, at the same time divine souls produce partial souls together with the demiurgus and vivific causes, in consequence of first proceeding into light, and abiding in their wholeness receiving the power of fabricating nature similar to themselves, besides, in the gods themselves, all the offspring of Saturn are brethren, according to the one generative monad by which they were produced, yet at the same time Jupiter is called father, in the divine poet Homer, both by Juno and Neptune, so that it is not at all wonderful, if Ocean and Tethys are called both brethren and fathers of Saturn and Rhea, in consequence of preserving as among brethren the paternal peculiarity, in the first place, therefore, the doubt may after this manner be solved, in the next place, it may be said, that of the divine titanic Hebdomads, Ocean indeed both abides and proceeds, uniting himself to his father, and not departing from his kingdom but all the rest rejoicing in progression, are said to have given completion to the will of earth, but to have assaulted their father, dividing themselves from his kingdom, and proceeding into another order, or rather, of all the celestial genera, some alone abide in their principles, as the two first triads, for, as soon as heaven understood that they had an implacable heart, and a lawless nature, he hurled them into Tartarus, the profundity of the earth, says Orpheus, he concealed them, therefore, in the unapparent, through transcendency of power, but others both abide in, and proceed from, their principles, as ocean and Tethys, for when the other titans proceeded to assault their father heaven, ocean prohibited them from obeying the mandates of their mother, being dubious of their rectitude, he, therefore, abides, and at the same time proceeds, together with Tethys, for she is conjoined with him according to the first progeny, but the other titans are induced to separation and progression, 
and the leader of these is the mighty Saturn, as the theologist says, though he evinces that Saturn is superior to ocean, by saying, that Saturn himself received the celestial Olympus, and that by being throned he reigns over the Titans, but that Ocean obtained all the middle allotment, for he says, that he dwells in the divine streams which are posterior to Olympus, and that he environs the heaven which is there, and not the highest heaven, but as the fable says, that which fell from Olympus, and was there arranged, 38, Ocean and Tethys, therefore, so far as they abide, and are united to heaven, producing conjunction with him the kingdom of Saturn and Rhea, and so far as they are established in the first power of their mother, so far they produce forces in conjunction with her, for she produces him together with Nereus and Thormus, from being mingled through love with the sea, for forces is not celestial, but ocean, as is evident from the Theogony, 39, and so far as Tethys is full of earth, so far being as it were a certain earth, she may be said to produce this forces in conjunction with ocean, so far as ocean also comprehends the intelligible in himself, hence Tethys, so far as she is earth according to participation, and ocean so far as he is causally the sea, give subsistence in conjunction with Saturn and Rhea to this god, if, however, any argument should demonstrate that in the intellectual order Saturn is above ocean, or rear above Tethys, it must be said that this arrangement is indeed there, for in that order the causes of intellection are superior to those of motion, but that here on the contrary, all things are in mutation and a flowing condition, so that here ocean is very properly prior to Saturn, since it is the fountain of motion, and Tethys is prior to rear. Hence, after another manner, the doubt may be thus solved, that we may speak, however, about each of these gods, Theonorus refers souls that subsist in habitude to these divinities, and arranges them as presiding over the three divisions of the world, and forces indeed, he arranges in the starless sphere, as moving the lation of the universe, he ought, however, to persuade us. That Plato was acquainted with a certain starless sphere, and afterwards, that he thus arranged forces in this sphere, but he places Saturn over the motions of the stars, because time is from these, and the generations and corruptions of things, and he places Rhea over the material part of the world, because by materiality she has a redundancy with respect to the divinities prior to herself. But the divine Jamblichus arranges them in the three spheres between the heavens and the earth, for some of the sublunary deities give a twofold division to the sublunary region, for these divide it in a threefold manner, and forces indeed, according to him, presides over the whole of a humid essence, containing all of it impartably, but real is a divinity connective of flowing and aerial formed spirits and Saturn governs the highest and most attenuated sphere of ether, having a middle arrangement according to Plato, because the middle and the center in incorporeal essences, have a greater authority than the power situated about the middle. We, indeed, admire this intellectual explanation of Jamblichus, but we think it proper to survey these gods everywhere, both in all the elements, and all orders for thus we shall behold that which is common in them, and which extends to all things, and we say, indeed, that forces is the inspective guardian of every spermatic essence, and of physical, and as it were spermatic productive principles, as being pregnant with, and the cause of generation, for there are spermatic productive principles in each of the elements, and different orders of gods and demons preside over them, all which Plato comprehends through forces, but King Saturn divides forms and productive principles, and produces more total into more partial powers, hence he is not only an animal but pedestrious, aquatic and a bird, and he is not only pedestrious, but likewise man and horse for the productive principles in him are more partial than in the celestial deities, 
among the intellectual gods, therefore, he is allotted this power, viz to multiply and divide intelligibles, hence, he is a leader of the titans, as being especially characterized by the dividing peculiarity, again, we say that Rhea receives the unapparent powers of King Saturn, led them forth to secondary natures, and excites the paternal powers to the fabrication of visible objects, for thus also, her first order is moved, is filled with power and life, and produces into that which is apparent, the causes that abide in Saturn, hence Saturn is everywhere the supplier of intellectual forms, Rhea is the cause of all souls, and of every kind of life, and forces is prolific with physical productive principles, since however another number of gods pertains to the kingdom of these, and which Saturn and Rhea comprehend, on this account Plato adds, and such as subsist together with these, for he not only through this comprehends daemons, as some say, but both the angelic and the daemoniacal Saturn have with themselves a multitude, the one angelic, but the other daemoniacal and the multitude which is in the gods is divine, that which is in the air is aerial, and in a similar manner in the other elements, and in the other more excellent genera, arranged under these gods, by the words also such as subsist together with these, Plato appears to signify the remaining titans, Viscourse and Hyperion, Chris, Japetus, and likewise the remaining Titanida, Visphobe, Thea, Memosine, Themis, and Dione, with whom Saturn and Rhea proceeded into light, also, those that proceeded together with forces, viz. Nereus and Thormus, the most motive Eurybia, and those who especially contain and connect the whole of generation, moreover, it is worthwhile to observe that it is not proper to discuss accurately the arrangement in these divinities, and whether Saturn or forces is the superior deity, for they are united and similar to each other, but if it be requisite to make a division, it is better to adopt the arrangement of the divine Jamblichus, viz that Saturn is a monad, but rear a certain due ad calling forth the powers that are in Saturn, and that forces gives perfection to their progression. Chapter XXXI it now remains that we direct our attention to the other kings, who produce the apparent sublunary order of things, for such is the arrangement which they are allotted. Plato adds therefore, that from Saturn and Rhea, Jupiter, Juno, and all such as we know are called the brethren of these descended, this is the third progression of the gods who are the fabricators of generation, but the fourth order closing as a tetrad the nomination of the leading gods, for the tetrad is comprehensive of the divine orders, but as a due and this progression is assimilated to the first kingdom, because that as well. As this is dyadic, there are, however, present with it, the all-perfect according to progression, and the uncircumscribed according to number, but Plato here not only adds the words such as, as in the progression prior to it, but likewise the word or, that he may indicate the progression of them to everything, for we use the term Toshon, such as in speaking of things united, but the term Topandas, or, in speaking of things now divided and multiplied, the total Tolikon, likewise pertains to this progression, for the gods which are denominated in it and those that proceed everywhere together with them, are characterized according to this form of fabrication, for all demiurgia total, who therefore are they, and what kind of order do they possess, the divine Jamblichus then asserts that Jupiter is the perfecter of all generation, but that Juno is the cause of power, connection, plenitude and life to all things and that the brethren of them are those that communicate with them in the fabrication of generation, being also themselves intellects, and receiving a completion according to a perfection and power similar to them, but Theodorus, again dividing the life which animates the total inhabitude, and forming it as he is accustomed to do into triads, 
calls Jupiter the power that governs the upper region as far as to the air, but you know the power who is allotted the aerial part of the world, and the brethren of them those that give completion to the remaining parts, for Jupiter is the essential of the soul that subsists in a material habit, because there is nothing more vital than essence, but Juno is the intellectual part of such a soul because the natures on the earth are governed by the productive principles proceeding from the air, and the other number is the psychical distributed into particulars, we, however, consequently to what has been before asserted, say, that according to Plato there are many orders of Jupiter, for one is the Demiurgus, as it is written in the Cratylus, another, is the first of the Saturnian triad, as it is asserted in the Gorgias, Another is the liberated, as it is delivered in the Phaedrus, and another is the celestial, whether in the inner Attic sphere, or among the planets. Moreover, as the first Jupiter produced into the visible fabrication the power of his father, which was concealed in the unapparent, being excited to this by his mother ear, after the same manner the Jupiter delivered here, who was the fabricator of genera. Shine causes the unapparent divisions and separations of forms made by Saturn to become apparent, Berea calls them forth, into motion and generation, and forces inserts them in matter, produces sensible natures, and adorns the visible essence, in order that there may not only be divisions of productive principles in natures and in souls, and in intellectual essences prior to these, but likewise in sensibles. For this is the peculiarity of fabrication, and if it be requisite to speak what appears to me to be the truth, Saturn indeed produces intellectual sections, but rear such as a psychical, and forces such as a physical, for all spermatic productive principles are under nature, but Jupiter adorning sensible and visible sections, gives a specific distinction to such beings in the sublunary region as are totally vital and causes them to be moved, since, however, these sensible forms which are generated and perfected, are multiformly evolved, being moved and changed according to all various evolutions, on this account, the Queen Juno is conjoined with Jupiter, giving perfection to this motion of visible natures, and to the evolution of forms. Hence fables represent her as at one time sending mania to certain persons, but ordering others to undergo severe labors, in order that through intellect being present with all things, and partial souls energizing divinely both theoretically and practically, every progression, and all the generation of the sublunary region may obtain complete perfection, such, therefore, being the nature of this duad. There are also other demiurgic powers which triply divide the apparent world of generation, one of these being allotted the government of air, another, that of water, and another that of earth, conformably to demiurgic allotments, hence they are said to be the brothers of these, because they also preside over the visible fabrication, and farther still, there are others the progeny of these which is the last progression of the divinities mentioned in this place by Plato, hence, they are delivered anonymously, Plato by this indicating the diminution of it as far as to the last division, for as in the gods that are above the world, the partible proceeds from the total fabrication, and the series of kings terminates in this, after the same manner also among the sublunary gods. The progeny of Jupiter proceed from the Jovian order, among which progeny, likewise, is the choir of partible fabrication, for the before mentioned demiurgy. Producing sensibles totally, it is necessary that those deities should have a subsistence who distribute different powers and peculiarities to different natures, and divide the sublunary generation into multitude. Hence Plato alone denominates their mothers, and does not employ the expressions such as, and all, because they are so set with all various diversity, with respect, therefore, to this Aeneid of gods, heaven terminates, earth corroborates, 
and ocean moves all generation, but Tethys establishes everything in its proper motion, intellectual essences in intellectual, middle essences in psychical, and such as a corporeal in physical, motion, ocean at the same time collectively moving all things, Saturn alone divides intellectually, Rhea vivifies, forces distributes spermatic productive principles, Jupiter perfects things apparent from such as are unapparent, and Juno evolves according to the all various mutations of visible natures, and thus through this Ennead all the sublunary world derives its completion, and is fitly arranged, divinely indeed from the gods, but angelically, as we say, from angels, and damonically from damons, the gods indeed subsisting about bodies souls and intellects, but angels exhibit in their providence about souls and bodies, and damons being distributed about the fabrication of nature, and the providential care of bodies, but again, the number of the Ennead is adapted to generation, for it proceeds from the monad as far as to the extremities without retrogression, 40, which is the peculiarity of generation, for reasons, i.e. productive principles, fall into matter, and are unable to convert themselves to the principles of their existence, moreover, the duad is triadic, for three dyadic orders were assumed, viz heaven and earth, ocean and tethys, Jupiter and Juno, and this last duad ranks as the fourth progression, because prior to it, is the triad forces, Saturn, and Rhea, which manifests the complication here, of the perfect and the imperfect, and of bound with infinity, for all celestial natures are definite, and as Aristotle says, are always in the end, but things in generation proceed from the imperfect to the perfect, and receive the same boundary indefinitely, besides this, the tetrad arising from the generation of these divinities is adapted to the orders of the fabricators of the sublunary region, in order that they may contain multitude unitedly, and the partible impartably, and also to the natures that exist in generation. 4. The sublunary elements are 4, the seasons according to which generation is evolved are 4, and the centers are 4, and in short, there is an abundant dominion of the tetrad in generation, why, however, it may be said, does Plato comprehend all the multitude of the gods that fabricate generation, in this Ennead, I answer, because this Ennead gives completion to all the fabrication of generation, for in the sublunary realms there are bodies and natures, souls, and intellects, and this both totally and partially and all these are in both respects in each of the elements, this Ennead in each of the elements, is as follows, viz total and partial bodies, total and partial natures, total and partial souls, and total and partial intellects, and the monad which contains these, viz the elementary sphere itself, because holds on parts are consubsistent with each other, heaven and earth, however, generate the unapparent essences of these, i.e. of holds on parts, the former indeed according to union, but the latter according to multiplication, and the former according to bound, but the latter according to infinity, being the leaders of essence to all things, but ocean and tethys give perfection to both the common and divided motion of them, there is, however, a different motion of different things, viz of total intellect, of total soul, and of total nature, and in a similar manner in such of these as are partial, the sublunary wholes, therefore, being thus adorned and distributed, Saturn, indeed, divides partial from total natures, but intellectually, rear, calls forth this division from intellectuals, into all various progressions as far as to the last forms of life, being a vivific deity, but forces produces the titanic separation, to physical productive principles, after these three, are the fathers of composite natures, and Jupiter indeed, aid on sensibles totally, according to an imitation of heaven, 
for the Jupiter in the intellectual order, proceeds analogous to the intellectual heaven, in the royal series, but Juno moves holes, fills them with powers, and evolves, according to every progression, and the gods posterior to this fabricate the partial works of sensibles, some according to one, but others according to another peculiarity, either demiurgic, or vivific, or perfective, or connective, being evolved and dividing themselves, as far as to the last of things, analogously to the Saturnian order, for the dividing peculiarity originates from the Saturnian dominion. Chapter XXXII. In the last place, let us consider why Plato denominates the sublunary deities, such as become apparent when they please, shall we say it is because these material elements are held forth before them as veils of the splendor of the ethereal vehicles which approximately suspended from them, for it is evident that being mundane they must also necessarily have a mundane starry vehicle, the light of them, however, shines forth to the view when they are about to benefit the places that receive their illumination. But if Plato says that they become visible when they please, it is necessary that this appearance of them should either be an evolution into light of the incorporeal powers which they contain, or of the bodies which are entirely spread under them. But if it is an evolution of their incorporeal powers, this is also common to the visible gods for they are not always apparent by their incorporeal powers, but only sometimes, and when they please, it is not proper, therefore, to divide the sublunary oppositely to the visible gods, according to that which is common to both, but so far as they have entirely something peculiar, but if they produce a luminous evolution of certain bodies when they please, they must necessarily use other bodies prior to these material elements, and which then become visible to us, when it seems fit to the powers that use them. Hence, other bodies more divine than such as are apparent, are spread under the invisible gods, and according to these, they are said to be, and are mundane. Through these also as media, they ride in and govern these elements for they impart to them as much of themselves as they are able to receive, and contain the forms and the natures of them in their powers, for since no one of these is an object of sense, and it is necessary that the vehicles of rational souls should be things of this kind, it is evident that they must use other vehicles prior to these visible bodies, with respect, however, to all the gods that govern generation, we must not say, that they have an essence mingled with matter, as the Stoics assert they have, for nothing which verges to matter is able to govern with intellect and wisdom, nor is properly a producing cause, but an organ of something else, nor must we say that they have an essence unmingled with matter, but powers and energies mingled with it, as Numenius and his followers assert, for the energies of the gods concur with their essences, and their inward subsist prior to their externally preceding energies, since our partial soul also prior to the life which is inserted in the animal suspended from it, contains a more principal life in itself, and prior to the externally preceding motion, through which it moves other things, it is moved with a motion converted to itself. The sublunary gods, therefore, are entirely unmingled with matter, adorning ended things mingled in an unmingled, and things generated, in an unbegotten manner, they likewise contain partibles impartibly, are the causes of life, the supplies of intellect, the replenishers of power, the givers of soul, the primary leaders of all good, and the sources of order, providence, and the best administration. They also give subsistence to more excellent animals about themselves, are the leaders of angels, the rulers of demons, and the prefects of heroes, governing through this triple army the whole of generation. If, therefore, we assert that the appropriate order of these divinities about generation, is the basis and seat of the total gods, we shall speak rightly.
and we shall likewise not err in asserting that they convolve the end of the divine decrement to the beginning, such then being the nature of these divinities, Plato indeed looking to the gods that are both intelligible and intellectual, and to those that are properly called intellectual, surveyed four progressions of them in common, but they also contain powers derived from the supermundane gods, whether they proceed from the twelve leaders, or from certain other deities, from the celestial choir of gods likewise, a certain order proceeds into generation, which, as the divine Jamblichus says, is doubled in its progression, for from the twenty-one leaders, forty-two governments of gods who are the fabricators of generation, are derived, according to each elementary allotment, but from the thirty-six decadarchs, forty-one, Seventy-two sublunary rulers proceed, and in a similar manner are the gods, being the double of the celestial gods in multitude, but falling short of them in power. It is likewise necessary to survey their triple progressions, their quintuple divisions, and their divine generation according to the Hebdomad, for they receive an orderly distribution in a threefold, fivefold, and sevenfold manner analogous to the whole world, in order that each of the elements may be a world, and may be truly an imitation of the universe. Such, therefore, is the concise doctrine concerning the sublunary gods, according to twofold essences, lives, and allotments, just as Plato also makes the ruling progeny of them to be dyadic. Chapter XXXII Having therefore discussed the theory pertaining to the celestial and sublunary gods, it now remains that we ascend to the summit or monad of all the mundane gods, Bacchus, in whose divinity they all subsist and are rooted, similarly to the fixed stars in the inner erratic sphere, for after this manner, every monad analogously contains its coordinate multitude, Bacchus therefore, is the mundane intellect from which the soul and body of the world are suspended, with respect however, to intellect it is necessary to observe that one kind is imparticipable and total, another is participable indeed but essentially so, and a third is participable, and subsists as a habit, all intellects unconnected with soul belong to the first kind, the mundane intellect, and the intellects of all. The mundane gods and beneficent demons, rank in the second division, and to the third class such intellects as ours belong. This deity also is the monad of the titans, or ultimate fabricators of things, by whom he is said in divine fables to have been torn in pieces, because the mundane soul which participates of this divinity, and is on this account intellectual, is participated by the titans and through them distributed into every part of the universe. Plato in the Cratylus says of this divinity that he is the giver of wine, and that Ionos. wine may most justly be denominated Ionos. because it is accustomed to deprive those of intellect who possessed it before on which words Proclus in his Miscolian that dialogue observes as follows. The young man Cratylus appears to inquire about our sovereign master Bacchus, as if it were about things of small importance, and on this account he is silenced by Socrates, 42, and he does not indeed pay attention to the occult, but only to the last and mundane progressions of the gods, these indeed, the wise man venerates, though as he says, they are sports, through these gods, Bacchus and Venus, being lovers of sport, for as he says of the terminations of the other gods, that they are terrible, and that they are venge and punish, and thus give perfection to souls, as for instance, that justice follows Jupiter, the avenger of the divine law, and that this divinity is benevolent to those whose manners are orderly, and who live according to intellect but that she is baneful to those who mingle their life with insolence and ignorance, till she has entirely subverted them, their houses and cities, in like manner, he venerates the terminations of Bacchus and Venus, which produce
sweetness of sensation, everywhere purifying our conceptions concerning the gods, and preparing us to understand that all things look to the best end, whatever it may be, for because the terminations of these divinities strengthen the infirmity of the mortal nature, and alleviate corporeal molestation, on this account the gods the causes of these things, are Philopevmones Lovers of sport, hence, of statues, they make some of them laughing and dancing, and exhibiting relaxation, but others austere, astonishing, and terrible to the view, analogously to the mundane allotments of the gods, but theologists frequently call Bacchus wine, from the last of his gifts, as for instance. Orpheus, says. I take all the members of wine, that are distributed, in the world, and bring them to me, if however the god is thus denominated, certainly his first and middle energies will be thus called, as well as his last, so that Socrates now looking to this calls the god. Divinisos. Beginning from wine, which as we have said manifests all the powers of Becus, thus also in the Phaedrus, Socrates calls love in common great, both that which is divine, and that which is a lover of body. By this epithet wine therefore, we must understand that the peculiarity of a partial intellect, is in common presented to our view, for the word. Eul. Such as, is nothing else than intellectual form separated from a total intellect, and in consequence of this becoming participated, particular and alone, for an all-perfect intellect is all things, and energizes according to all things with invariable sameness, but a partial and participated intellect, is indeed all things, but this according to one form, such as our solar, lunar, or mercurial form. This therefore, the peculiarity of which is to be separated from the rests, wine indicates. Signifying an intellect such as, and particular. Since, therefore, every partial fabrication is suspended from the Dionysiacal or Bechic monad, which distributes participated mundane intellect from total intellect, or that intellect which ranks as a whole many souls from one soul, and all sensible forms from their proper wholenesses, on this account theologists call both this God and all his fabrications wine, for all these are the progeny of intellect, and some things participate of the partial distribution of intellect in a more distant, but others in a nearer degree. Wine therefore energizes in things analogous to its subsistence in them, in body indeed, after the manner of an image, according to a false opinion and imagination but in intellectual natures, according to an intellectual energy and fabrication, for in the laceration of Bacchus by the Titans, the heart of the god is said to have alone remained undistributed, i.e. the indivisible or impartable essence of intellect, with respect to the mundane soul which is the immediate participant of this Bacchic intellect, the composition of it is most accurately delivered by Plato in the Timors, and admirably unfolded by Proclus in his commentaries on that dialogue, for full information therefore on this subject I refer the reader to those works, and shall only summarily observe at present that there are five genera of being, from which all things after the first being are composed, viz essence, permanency, motion, sameness, and difference. For everything must possess essence, must abide in its cause, from which also it must proceed, and to which it must be converted, must be the same with itself and certain other natures, and at the same time different from others, and distinguish in itself. But Plato for the sake of brevity, assumes only three of these in the composition of the mundane soul, viz essence, sameness, and difference for the other two must necessarily subsist in conjunction with these, when therefore Plato says, that from an essence impartable, and always subsisting according to sameness of being, and from a nature divisible about bodies, 
the demiurgus mingled from both a third form of essence, having a middle subsistence between the two, by the impartable essence he means intellect, and by the nature which is divisible about bodies, a corporeal life, hence the mundane soul is a medium between the mundane intellect, and the whole of that corporeal life which the world participates. We must not however suppose that when the soul is said to be mingled from these two, the indivisible and divisible natures are consumed in the mixture, as is the case when corporeal substances are mingled together, but we must understand that the soul is of a middle nature between these, so as to be different from each, and yet a participant of each, in short, the intellect participated by soul, is called by Plato impartable. But the nature which is divisible about bodies is the corporeal form life proceeding from the mundane soul, and which has the relation of splendor to it, for intellect is analogous to the sun, soul, to the light proceeding from the sun, and a divisible life to the splendor proceeding from light. Proclus observes on the above cited words of Plato, that they are conformable to the Orphic traditions, for, says he, 43. Orpheus does not predicate the impartable of every intelligible or intellectual order, but according to him there are certain natures superior to this appellation, in the same manner as others are superior to other names, for king and father are not adapted to all the divine orders, where, therefore, according to Orpheus, shall we first survey, the impartable, in order that we may understand the divine conception of Plato, Orpheus therefore establishes one demiurgus of every divisible fabrication, analogous to the one father who generates the total fabrication, and from him produces the whole intellectual mundane multitude, the number of souls, and corporeal compositions, and this one demiurgus indeed, i.e. Bacchus, generates all these unitedly. But the gods that surround him, divide and separate his fabrications. Orpheus however says, that all his other fabrications were distributed into parts by the gods whose characteristic is of a dividing nature, but that his heart alone was preserved impartable, through the providence of Minerva. For since he gives subsistence to intellects, souls and bodies, but souls and bodies indeed, receive in themselves an abundant division and distribution into parts, intellect remaining united and indivisible, being all things in one, and comprehending total intelligibles in one intellection, this being the case, he says that the intellectual essence alone, and the intellectual number was saved entire by Minerva, for says he, the intellectual heart alone was left, directly calling it intellectual. If therefore the impartable heart is intellectual, it will evidently be intellect and an intellectual number, not indeed every intellect, but the mundane, for this is the impartable heart, since the divided God was also the fabricator of this. Orpheus therefore calls the impartable essence of Bacchus intellect, but he denominates the life which is divisible about body, which is physical, and pregnant with seeds the genitals of the God, and he says that Diana who presides over all the generation in nature, and is the midwife of physical productive principles, extends these genitals, distributing as far as to subterranean natures, the prolific power of the God, but all the remaining body of Bacchus was, he says, the psychical essence, this also being divided into seven parts. For they divided all the seven parts of the body, says the theologist, speaking of the Titans, just as Timos divides the soul into seven parts, and perhaps Timos, when he says that soul is extended through the whole world, will remind the followers of Orpheus of the Titanic division, through which soul is not only spread round the universe like a veil, but is also extended through it. Very properly therefore, does Plato call the essence which is proximately above soul, an impartable essence, and in short, he thus denominates the intellect which is participated by soul, 
following the Orphic fables, and wishing to be as it were an interpreter of what is said in the mysteries and thus much concerning Becus, or the monad of the mundane gods.